I worked on field level and cipher. I worked on crypto usage statistics. So you can kind of get an idea. Crypto is my passion. I am a huge crypto nerd. And not like in the terms, everybody, when I tell them I do crypto, they say, oh, do you do blockchain? I'm like, no, I don't do blockchain. I'm on the security side of cryptography. So my goal in life is to keep data protected. That means your credit card numbers, your social security number, anything that you think should be private, my goal is to make sure that data stays private. So that's, that's who I am as a crypto person. So I do software design and development. I create samples for clients, which is really fun. Um, I do crypto education. I actually founded the crypto education community because what I found is when I would meet with clients and I tell them about all these cool you know, tools that we could use, they were actually having trouble trying to figure out how to use them. And sometimes they wouldn't even ask or say anything because they're afraid to speak up because they're afraid of what other people think. And so whenever I go into a session, I always tell people there are no dumb questions. So to you guys who are here, as we go through this session, we're going to talk about security. We're going to talk about cryptography. We're going to put this in a context of IoT data. I want you to ask questions as we go. There is no such thing as a dumb question. If you want to know what a bit is, I will explain what a bit is. Really, just please ask. Please be comfortable. By the time you, you know, end this session, I want you to have like a good understanding of what is pervasive encryption and why is it important. So a little bit about the college side of me. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. I got my Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, I have a Master's in Information Technology, which I got when I was in New York at RPI. So those are my two schools. I haven't gotten a doctorate. My dad will tell you he wants me to, but I like corporate life. I like you know putting stuff in action. So what we're going to kind of start with is I want to give you a, a context for this Internet of Things thing. How many people have heard of Internet of Things? Awesome. How many people have used the Internet of Things? I would expect everybody's hand go up as well. Because all of the time you have different devices, you have sensors embedded in them so that you can actually send data, you can send commands. Anybody heard of Ring? You know, the little doorknob? Yeah, you, you or I won't say doorknob, doorbell, where you can actually click on it and you can actually see like an image. You don't have to be home to see that. You can be anywhere. So these are some of the IoT devices. In our particular case here, I'm focused a little bit on the, the health side of things. So in terms of you know, how these health devices work and how they can contain sensitive information and how that sensitive information needs to be secured. Now, it doesn't just have to be health information. There could be other information that needs to be secured, like payment card data, social security numbers. Many, different, many different types of data would need to be secured, but we're just going to go through a few of them because I think everybody can kind of relate to you know, health data. So here we got smart scales. Has anybody ever used one? They are pretty nifty. Still trying to figure out how they can figure out like what my body mass is, bone mass, and percentage of water, and, and all this other things that they calculate. But it's pretty nice to have. Heart monitors are vital for people who have like heart issues. And also physical activity trackers. So you may say, okay, these are cool things. Do they really need to be secured? Yes. Why? Why do we need to secure our IoT data? Well, one reason is because there are regulations, and these regulations actually say that data needs to be secured. Private data about you needs to stay private. So we have two in the U.S. We have HIPAA and we have high tech. Both of these regulations are around different organizations and different providers who are going to be storing health data, using health data, transmitting health data, transcribing health data. They have to comply with these regulations. So then the question would be, okay, so HIPAA high tech, they say you have to make sure that personal health information, you know, is secured, is kept private. So then you have to figure out, okay, well, well what is PHI? Well, what is your current past or future physical health condition? Could you get that from a heart monitor? Could you get that from your scale? So there's all of this data about you that will be considered personal health information. The provision of health care, your payment for the provision of health care. What does that say when you're paying a certain provider for health care? It says, hmm, they might have a problem. That's useful information. That's information that should be kept private. So who does this impact? So you might say, oh, it's just a health insurance company. That's a good start. But also think the doctors, the clinics, the dentists psychologists, chiropractors, pharmacies, 
Think about any business associates which may be handling that medical information. So you don't have to be one of these to actually have to comply with HIPAA and high tech. You just have to be someone that's actually making use of that health data. In addition to the regulations that you have in the healthcare industry, there are also things which are fun and cool. PCI DSS, how many people have heard of that one? Awesome. Some people are like, you know, and if you're working with payment cards, or you know, MasterCard, Visa, Amex, or any of those cards, then PCI DSS is a big one. And in fact, for most of my uh, career time at, in IBM, PCI DSS was the biggest focus. But it's not anymore. What is? GDPR. GDPR, you guys know. And for those who don't know, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, they actually, you may say, well, they only apply to Europe. Why do we care about this in the US? Well, do you have any data for European citizens in your systems? Did they come to visit, you know? Did they have to go to your hospital? Did they ride in your car? That data is protected under GDPR. And so that's a big deal. That was last year, I think May 25th was the date for GDPR. So we're still waiting to kind of see what some of the fallout is for that. But these regulations are a big deal for companies. Now let's say regulations are important. We definitely want to comply with those. But what are other reasons that you might want to secure your IoT data? Well. You could have a data breach. How many people have heard of data breaches? Have you gotten new credit cards in the last couple of years? Because they just, out of the kindness of their heart, thought you needed a new one. <laughs> <laughs> data breaches are a common occurrence. They do happen. It's no longer a matter of if a data breach is going to happen. It's a matter of when. So you want to prepare for a data breach. You want to prepare for someone to you know, sneak into your network, and now they're sniffing around looking at your databases, looking at your files, looking at data sets, looking at your audit records, trying to find some sensitive information. Likelihood of a breach, 28%. Average cost of a breach, it's a little bit of chump change there, $3.6 million. And don't also, don't also forget to think about things like your reputational risk. Let's see, data breaches you guys have heard about. Anybody's heard about Home Depot was one. There's Target, there's Sony. I'm sure the list kind of goes on and on. And I'm not saying this to condemn any particular one company. That's not the point. The point is that data breaches do happen. And your goal is, as a security person, is to make sure that if that data breach happens, that your data is protected. I love to see a data breach. Well, okay, I don't, love, I don't love to see a data breach. But if I see a data breach, and then I go, and I read through the article, and it says, yes, but all the records are encrypted, that is a win. I am happy. Data breaches do happen. But the idea is, as a security person, you're trying to make sure that that data remains secure, even if that data breach does happen. So one of the things that makes me depressed is 14.7 billion records. How many were encrypted? 4%. Now when you think about it, encryption and crypto APIs and technology, have, they're embedded in hardware. We have software. There are services and various solutions. Why is it that only 4% is encrypted? And one issue is complexity. Have you ever tried to write a crypto application? It is really fun, just FYI, for some people. <laughs> But for most, it is fairly complex. You need to know algorithms. You need to know key sizes. You need to know initialization vectors. There are APIs available in Java and C. There's Assembler, if you're bold. There's so many different ways that you can encrypt data. But it takes work. It takes time. It takes skills. It takes resources. And so oftentimes, people kind of bypass the crypto stuff, saying, it's secure enough. It's behind the firewall. It's perfectly OK. But it's not perfectly OK anymore. We need to make sure that the data is encrypted at the source, at that piece of data. So extensive use of encryption is one of the most impactful ways to help reduce the risk and financial loss of a data breach. So we know this already. It also helps meet compliance mandates. So there really is two things here we're considering. One, you have to make sure you comply with those regulations, PCI DSS, GDPR, HIPAA. But also, as me as a consumer, because I'm one of the people who have a credit card, I have a social security number, and I want that number to be protected, I want them to be worried about data breaches. I want my data to be safe. So data. What is this data? Where does it come from? Where does it go? What is the life of this piece of data? Well, you have acquisition. That's when you actually create you know, the data. You generate it. You copy it. You use that data in an operation. You can archive that data for later use, and you can dispose of that data at some point. 
So along this life cycle, going, either going here or going from use to archival, that data needs to be protected wherever it might live. Think about disaster recovery. When you copy data over to another computer system, are you sure that the data there is going to be encrypted and protected just as strong as it was in your production environment? Have you considered that? But what about when you dispose of the data? You just throw out that disk. Is that good enough? No? Where might your sensitive IoT data reside? In the device itself, of course, that's where it's being collected. In the internet packet that's being transmitted to the healthcare provider. Yep, it's so over the network. How about in memory of the receiving application on the server? Yep, it's there too. How about the database, which writes the, the data eventually to a file or a data set? Yep, it's there. Active disk or tape storage? There too. Archived storage, right, for redundancy? Yep, there too. Disaster recovery backup system? Yes. So where does that data need to be protected? Everywhere. Everywhere. So this is a picture of the idea, the concept of pervasive encryption. The idea is that the data needs to be protected from the time that it is acquired until the time that it's saved on disk or until the time that it is um, disposed. That data needs to be protected. So you collect that data here. So let's say it's the heart monitor data. It's going to flow over a network into a system. That system might share that data with other systems. It needs to be protected there. That data, as it flows over the storage area network, should be protected as well as it's saved on disk needs to be protected. So the idea is that the data needs to be protected wherever it lives, not just, you know, hey, I got network you know, protection, so that's it. What if someone gets into your system here? Well, now they have access to your data because we're, we're going with that policy of we're not assuming that no one can get through your network. So people have. It happens. So are you securing your data everywhere that data lives? That's the question we're asking, and that's what we're trying to do with pervasive encryption. Pervasive encryption is a journey. It's not something that you're just going to turn on and automatically everything is like, you know, perfectly there. Now, there is a really easy component to use in terms of pervasive encryption, but the idea is that it's a strategy. It's something that you're looking at for an organization to decide, hey, we have this sensitive data. Let's make sure that wherever that data exists, only the right people have access to that data. So we're going to start from the outside and kind of work our way in. So on the outside, you want to encrypt some data in flight. So you can use network encryption. So network encryption gives you a means of transporting data from you know, one entity to another entity and make sure that the data is encrypted within. One example of a connection protocol is a handshake, which is kind of shown here. So me, I will say I'm IBM person. I work on mainframes. So this is a mainframe. It's beautiful. These things are like huge. They're like taller than me. They're like ridiculously huge, but they're awesome. Um, so here, you have our person here, requests a secure connection. The server will send back its certificate. The client here will validate that certificate, generate a session key, encrypt that session key with the server's public key that was contained in the certificate, and then send that encrypted session key back to the server. The server here will decrypt the session key with the server's private key, and now you have a session key which is essentially the same on the client and on the server so they can send data back and forth to one another. So that ensures that the connection and the messages that are sent across are protected. And notice the client didn't have to actually authenticate themselves, right? When you go to Amazon, you can actually start looking up stuff on the, you know, different things you want to purchase without actually, like, logging in. And that's because they don't need you to authenticate yourself in order to do this process of handshaking, creating a secure connection. It's just the server certificate, which is what you're connecting with. Now, there are other protocols. You can have a client certificate, and you can authenticate and establish this connection at the same time. So there's different things you can do. But when you're actually going to a website and you're trying to make a purchase, or you're going to a secure website of, of any site, even if, even if you're not making a purchase, you don't actually have to have your own client certificate. And all of this stuff is happening under the covers without you knowing about it. It's pretty cool. So that's before you kind of get into the system. So that's on the network. So now that you're actually like there, you're on your system, whether it's, you know, whether it's a Windows or Linux or whether it's DOS or whatever it might be, now you're there and you've got this data. It's come across the wire. That data is encrypted while it's on the wire, while it's coming across the network. But when it lands, it's in the clear. So what do you do with it? You encrypt it. How? Well, it depends. 
there's different types of encryption for data at rest. Data at rest can sit in the application. It can be encrypted at that level. It can be encrypted at the database level. It can be encrypted at the file level or the volume level. It can also be encrypted at the disk and tape level. And oftentimes you will see all four of these layers actually implemented. Now, in terms of this chart and this pyramid shape, there's a special kind of component to this, right? There's a reason that this shape was chosen. Because depending on what level of encryption you do, you're either going to have a lot of coverage or you're going to have a lot of complexity but a lot of security control. So at the bottom here, full disk and tape encryption encrypts everything. 100% everything on that disk and tape is encrypted. So that's awesome. What does that protect you against? Physical removal. So if someone goes and they tries to pull a disk and tape out, it's protected. You don't have to worry about it. So what is that in terms of disposing of data? How can you dispose of like your disk and tape? Just encrypt it. Nobody can use it after you've encrypted it. Right? Same thing as whole disk encryption. And most of you guys probably have on your if you have a corporate laptop, you know? Same concept. Somebody, you know, if you leave your if you accidentally leave your laptop, you know, in an airport somewhere, <laughs> not doing it on purpose, but if it happens, <laughs> and you might say to yourself, you know, well, as long as the person doesn't have my user ID and password, I'm safe. No big deal. Well, what would they do? Computer savvy person, what would they do? They don't need your password. They don't need your user ID. Flip the laptop over, get a screwdriver, take out your hard drive, plug into another system. Boom, there's your data on the clear. Easy peasy. So with disk and tape encryption, they wouldn't actually be able to see that data because it would all be protected. So same concept applies to enterprise systems as it applies to your laptops, is that full disk and tape encryption protects you from someone physically removing it. But if the person actually had your username and password, will this protect you? No, not at all. It only protects you once you've removed that device. So then you might say, okay, well now I want to protect myself from other things too, not just people, somebody removing it. What if somebody's actually in my system? Maybe you have a system that has 100 or thousands of users that are logging onto the same system. And you only want certain people to be able to see certain data. So then you can start using these kind of mechanisms where you can do file level encryption or data set level encryption, where you can actually encrypt at the data set level. So you can have people who have access to a data set. And a data set on the mainframe is like a file. It's like the same thing. Um, so they have access to the data set so they can read, they can write, they can do all kinds of stuff. But if you turn on data set level encryption, now you can have people who can delete a data set, they can move a data set, they can rename a data set, but they can't open it. When they open it, it will fail because they only have access to the data set container but not the actual contents within. And what that means is if you have storage administrators, someone who needs to be able to move things around and you know, manage your volumes of data, they can do their job without ever having to see people's social security numbers. And they shouldn't see people's social security numbers. They shouldn't see credit card numbers. So the idea is that you want to make sure that only the people who should see sensitive data will see that data. And that gives you one more means of doing it. And it's very broad. So it has a lot of coverage. And as you kind of go up here, you're going to see it's going to get a little more complicated to implement. So once you get to database encryption, now you actually have more granularity. That means that your database administrator Actually, at this level, the database administrator would still be able to see the data in the clear because they pretty much own all the resources. However, anybody who kind of comes afterwards, all that data will be protected. When it's here, when it goes in the file, it will still be protected. When it goes on disk, it's protected. But in database encryption, the data is encrypted in memory. What does that mean if you ever have a problem and you have to look at audit logs or our mainframe stumps? That means that the data in that dump is still encrypted. So imagine you have a database, and that database is for like a payment card system, right? You have all your users, all the user IDs, you have all the credit card numbers all in there, and then you find that there's a problem with the database. And now you have to send that database to, uh, to uh, someone else to have them diagnose it, you know, maybe a, a service team. Well, what is that service team? What do they see? Well, if that data is in the clear, they see all the credit card numbers in the clear as well. So you hope whoever you're working with, whoever vendor you're working with, is protecting that data or that you have an arrangement so that they're not going and siphoning off your credit card numbers. Whereas if you had that data encrypted in memory, even if you were to send them a dump of, you know, this is the system and this is everything in the environment, all that data would still be protected. Application level encryption, that's my favorite because I like to code. Um, application level encryption is fun for me, not necessarily for everybody, but you guys might find this fun because you guys are all coders, right? This is awesome. 
I write so many samples for like customers with coding, so it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. But with application level encryption, now you have so much granularity and so much control over what data gets encrypted and what does not. You can encrypt like four bytes of data, you can encrypt 4,000 terabytes of data. It's at your control. You're passing in you know, your data, you're specifying which algorithm, which parameters, which initialization vector, um, which padding, which mode. You have all of this control. However, what happens if you know, two years from now they say DES is out of date and now you need to use a new, uh, switch to a different algorithm? Well, now you have to change your application. So when you're coding at the application level, you're very sensitive to any changes that happen in the industry because you're going to have to go and change your application. You're going to have to retest, redesign, and roll it out again. So application level gives you a lot of control, but it also gives you a lot more work and resource and effort. So that's one reason that people may encrypt at this level or this level. It may not go here. But it really depends on the organization. Generating encryption keys, there are symmetric keys and asymmetric keys. Symmetric keys are the ones that you use to encrypt the bulk data. And the ones you typically hear about, data encryption standard, DES, triple DES, AES, the advanced encryption standard. Um, these are basically just random numbers. They come from random number generators. You generate those random numbers, and those random numbers serve as your keys. And those keys have a particular key length. The longer the key length, the better. Want to know why? What's easy to do with very few numbers? Brute force. What is a brute force attack for a random number? Try every combination. So the shorter key you have, the easier it is for our computers to try every combination to figure out what your key is. The longer your keys get, the more difficult it is. So pretty much now, a 256-bit key, that will take your, your kids, 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 kids can't break that key. Quantum computers can't break this key either. So you want to choose keys with stronger key lifts. And this is why you shouldn't use DES56 anymore, because this can, broke, can get broken in like three days. So don't use this one. <laughs> So encryption engine. So um, one of the good things that, about my job, I work at IBM, is I work on mainframes. These are huge computers, and you see like <laughs> they have all these different PCIO devices, and you have like all of these like different um, CPC drawers for different processing units. You have so much power at your disposal. But um, you want to consider, you know, what your needs are. If you're doing an IoT device, you're not putting this in somebody's heart, right? <laughs> I mean, it'd be a little tough to get it in there. So you're going to consider things like, you know. Um, what software or what hardware you need, um, the reliability characteristics. For instance, if it's heart monitor, then it needs to be very reliable. If it's a smart scale, eh, you may be able to be okay. So you want to consider things like industry certifications and performance. Um, you want to consider memory requirements. A lot of this goes into, like, you know, if you have, like, these really small chips on these really small devices, then you're going to have some constraints in terms of memory and storage. But if you have something like a mainframe, because now you're on your back-end system, then you don't have those issues. So you're going to have different operating systems that are available. You're going to have different APIs and libraries that you want to consider. There's so much that you have in, at your disposal from a crypto perspective. So my goal in life is to get that 4% number higher <laughs> um, so we can have more data that's encrypted. Uh, specifically for Z14, which is the, new, um, the latest uh, mainframe that came out, we have two different crypto hardware engines, the Crypto Express, which is a hardware security module. It's tamper sensing and responding. We also have CPACF, so every processing unit also has crypto capability. And in terms of operations, CPACF, which is like right there with the processor, 327,891 crypto operations per second. And Crypto Express, 10,569 operations per second. So both are super fast. So getting back to our picture of securing IoT data, we're really looking at trying to protect that data everywhere that data lives, wherever that data goes. That is our goal with pervasive encryption. Now, there are some new and cool technologies that are coming. Um, these you just kind of keep your, keep your eye on. Um, how many people have heard of crypto anchors? Ah, cool. One of the nice things about working at IBM is they have a huge like, research and development team, and they always are coming up with these cool things. So uh, crypto anchors actually tie into blockchain. The idea that you can actually track something that's like, like smaller than like, like a grain, like a salt. And um, the idea with the crypto anchors is that you can embed those in different types of things. So you can track diamonds. You've heard of like blood diamonds in Africa. You can actually track their origination point by storing these crypto anchors as part of it. And you can do that not just with diamonds, but you can do that with other things. So if you ever wanted to.
to track a particular item, you know, from its source through distribution to where it lands, and you want to ensure its authenticity, you can do that with crypto anchors. Homomorphic encryption is cool. I'm still watching this space to see if it gets like faster and faster. But the idea is that you never want your data to be in the clear at any point. You always, if you could have your data like protected at all times, that would be perfect. However, when you're trying to do an operation on the data, you have to decrypt it, then do the operation, and then encrypt it again. Well, homomorphic encryption would take that away, right? You can actually do operations on encrypted data. So that means the data never actually appears in the clear. Now, Right now, they're still performing. It still takes way too long to do that. We need our operations to be much faster. So they're still continuing to enhance it, but the concept is there. The idea that you can work and operate on encrypted data is important. Another cool thing that we have on the horizon is this HyperProtect family. And the HyperProtect family actually runs on Linux. So most of people, you know, they may not be familiar with Z and mainframes, but they all know Linux. And on the Linux side, now you can actually make use of the crypto that's in the hardware from a Linux environment through REST APIs and things that people who are, you know, newer, younger, you know, can actually work with and be very easy to use. So you get a lot of the qualities of service of IBM Z in the mainframe, but in an interface that's much easier to be able to use. And I'm going to open it up and let you guys ask questions for the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so. There's a question in there. Secured by race. Mm -hmm. uh, what is race? Oh yes. So this is secured by RACF. RACF is the Resource Access Control Facility. Um, it's basically gives it off. It's an authorization facility for ZOS. So basically, um, what RACAP does is you can define resource profiles. So you can protect various services from being used, servers from being used, um, files and data sets from being used, all controlled through RACAP. Think of things like being able to define a resource, give it a name, give it a, a universal access of none, so no one can access it, and then you can permit a specific user ID to be able to use that resource or not. So basically, it just controls, it's just an access control mechanism for ZOS. And in some cases, what you have is you'll have people who say, well, because I have RACF, because I said, you know, I have, you know, RACF authority, so if someone has read access, someone has update access, someone has none access, they may say that's good enough that they don't need encryption. And then my question is to them, well, how many people have what's called operations authority? Operations authority is what you would give to someone who's a storage administrator, which allows them to open any data set, right? Well, what's in your data sets? Sensitive information. Should they be able to open those data sets? Do they need to? No. But by nature of their job, they just happen to have the authority that gives it to them. So what if you can have a means that prevents them from being able to view that data? Or what about someone who wants to, you know, has access to the data and they want to, you know, FTP it off platform? Well, if that data is encrypted and they FTP it off platform, how useful is it? Not at all. Basically, your resource access control, that facility is in effect while you're on that system and only when you're on that system. Once that data leaves that system, whatever means it does, your data is in the open unless it's encrypted. Terms of time that the adding, oh sorry, adding uh, encrypt every stage of the interaction of the data is add additional cost to um, time and, and latency. performance and latency. Play. Yeah. Yes, there will be there will be an increase in latency, but it's not. But it depends. Basically, there are many different technologies, as you can see, that you can actually implement to encrypt data. Like when you're doing disk and tape encryption, that is no latency effect whatsoever because that's always done. Like when you have a self-encrypting device, it's always encrypting. So that, that's of, of no, it's just normal business as usual. However, when you implement things like data set level encryption, database level, application level, now with those operations, normally let's say you're doing a select statement and you're just doing select of one particular field in the database. Before you just go select and get it back in the clear, easy. Now you go get it and now it has to make a call to a crypto engine to decrypt it and then it has to <laughs> decrypt it and send it back out to you. So now what you're going to have is you're going to have a latency of actually going to the crypto engine. So that's why choosing the appropriate encryption engine is very important because it depends on your application. We have some applications which will make calls here, 
because it's more secure, it was tamper responding. However, we have some applications that make the calls here, even though this is in the clear, not tamper responding, because it's faster. So as a security administrator, you always have to make, there's going to be trade-offs, and you have to decide which trade-offs are worth it. So you want to, like I want to say, like my shirt says, encrypt everything, right? But you still have to be smart about it, right, and how you do it. There might be some things that you know need to be encrypted at the application level um, because they're just super sensitive. But then other things you might decide to encrypt at another level because it's just easier to implement or maybe you have performance considerations that you have to think about. So my question is... Oh. <laughs> My question is actually about encrypt everything. So it's related to what you've answered before, but um, can you give some specific examples where maybe it's not necessarily needed to be encrypted? Why would you not want to encrypt everything? <laughs> My heart is hurting here. Um, <laughs> if the data is, if you know the data is non-sensitive, then that would be something that you would not encrypt. In today's environment, at least what I see when I work with different um, enterprise clients and customers, is that sometimes they don't know what's sensitive and what's not. And that's where you want to use something that's like data set level or disk and tape level because it covers everything. And they don't have to do a lot of you know, searching around because it's really hard if, you have, if you're on a system that's been around for 50 years and you've had different people come on and off, and you have different teams working on it, different applications, and you're trying to figure out, well, what's sensitive and what's not. If you know that you know that it's not sensitive, then that would definitely be something that you could say, okay, I'm not going to worry about that. But if you know that it's sensitive or if you're unsure that it's sensitive, that's where you might want to go ahead and protect it. So I guess the only case where I would say don't encrypt would be if you know that it's not sensitive. <laughs> I have a question about, so technology is always like improving, so that means that some of the protocol or method kind of duplicate, and then there's a new, new test latest coming up. What is the strategy that you are adapting to like a newest and latest or like retiring the old, older technology? Because I think my understanding is that the newer technology tend to take more space or you need more capacity. I mean, it's not necessarily that true mm -hmm. always, but also when you have to retire all the technologies, that also it's a kind of costly process too. Yeah, that is a good question. It needs to be part of the, like for any organization, that needs to be part of their plan. As they're implementing the new technologies, they should think about how they're going to migrate from old technologies to the new. Like, are they going to completely dispose of the old technologies? And even if they are going to go move it, are they going to be moving it to new algorithms and things like that? And how does that affect the data that's been encrypted with something that had, you know, oh, that DES56 that I told nobody to use? Like, now they want to move to AES256. Well, now they have to go and actually re-encrypt everything using this new algorithm. So that will take its toll. And I have found that customers who are moving from one algorithm to the next, it does take time to do. It's not something that's going to happen like that. So you actually have to plan that as part of your data, pro like your, I want to say your, your data retention process. It's, you're going to have this data for 50 years, then know that the technology is going to change. And you have to, as part of your process, ensure that as technologies change, as algorithms become more advanced, that they're going to be you know, continuously improving and making sure that data remains protected into the future. So it is something that has to be considered. Sort of, do you have a, some kind of trade-off, or it really depends on what customer need or wants? It really depends. Okay. And it's funny, because IBM will always give you that it depends answer, and we get made fun of it a lot, because there's so much customization. Like, I can't, like, give you, like, a best, like, oh, everybody does this, because everybody doesn't do this. You'll have somebody that does a little bit of this or a little bit of that. You have some people that don't code at the application level. And for those who don't code at the application level, maybe moving from one algorithm to the next is easy. Like if you're doing database encryption and you want to move from one algorithm to another, generate a new key with the new key length and the new algorithm, and then just redo the table. That's not very difficult. But if you have someone coding at the application level, it's not so simple. Maybe there's a new API. Maybe there's a new initialization vector. So that may require more changes. It really depends on the actual like, environment and how they've encrypted the various, data, various pieces of data. But great questions. All right. So um, I think we are supposed to end the session soon, but there might be time for one more question. Anyone interested? All right.
Okay, when you mention about the operations on encrypted data, um, can you elaborate a little bit more? Because if you provide an SDK to operate or something like that on the encrypted data, anybody can, s what I mean, could be stolen or something. So is this about the homeomorphic yeah. encryption? All right, I actually have a related question about that. I wanted to know, um, like, what is the kind of impediment to make it faster and more scalable? Because particularly, I'm interested in this because I work on a lot of like machine learning algorithms, and mm -hmm. it would be really nice to be able to do like matrix modifications and stuff like that, you know, faster and yeah. not have that concern. But yeah, and I won't say that I'm a homomorphic encryption expert. I'm definitely not in research, but from what I understand, they have gotten. I think the last article I said is that it's 75, 75 times faster than it used to be. However, that's still not as fast as we need it to be, and not as fast as the other algorithms. And what they were actually doing was like basic mathematical operations. That like they were able to do like ads and things like those. So um, I'd have to do a little research to kind of give you exactly everything that they were able to perform, um, and exactly like what those performance numbers are. But I do know like for today's operations that unfortunately a homomorphic encryption, though it has a lot of potential, and we're still working on speeding it up. It is like it's not as nowhere near as fast as our, our current encryption operations. So, so that's kind of an impediment to actually using it right now. And uh, selfishly, I have one more question to ask. <laughs> so if you're trying to go to another session, feel free to leave. But um, I was curious if homeomorphic encryption isn't going to be to the rescue anytime soon for people who are actively practicing machine learning and like are very concerned about mm -hmm. privacy of data. Would uh, federated learning, do you see that as a, you know, like a earlier available option to kind of solve some of these data problems? And for those who are, you know, maybe less aware, um, federated learning is where you kind of uh, train the train on the data on your device and you just send back the results to a kind of a central um, algorithm and the central algorithm will do the update. So that's kind of the idea of federated learning. But wondering if you have thoughts on that. I haven't heard about federated learning, so I'm like learning as you were talking about, like what is federated learning? How, what, are this, what, are the, what is the application of encryption to federated learning? So, um, well, for one example, like the data would not be in flight as much, and therefore it is more secure uh, because you reduce a lot of the vectors for like, um, you know, leaking data or losing data, right? But the idea is that uh, you can basically send an algorithm to your phone, for example, and I know Google does this with their uh, keyboard and how they autocorrect your typos, right? So for example, if you tend to make the same kind of typos, they can send an algorithm to your phone, it will kind of train on your local data while you're sleeping, while the phone's plugged in, it's not using a lot of battery, and in the morning you can send the data all the way to Google's like, you know, main compute server or whatever, and then basically use all the data that was training overnight on your device to update um, their algorithm about how they can like help you type words better, right? So you know that's like one way I see where you can keep data more secure because it's not doing a lot of the transferring, a lot of the, I don't know. So with the federated learning, is it like contacting a server of some sort in its um, reading of data, or is it pull so let's say let's say I, like I have data like on my mobile phone, and on that mobile phone I'm running this algorithm. Is it like contacting a server with my data? It is not contacting a server with data. It is uh, basically computing some uh, mathematical operations results and sending the results back mm -hmm. because that's what the central algorithm needs to be able to make its uh, gradient updates, right? Yeah. But it does, uh, the central server actually does not see your data. Okay, so then the, yeah, so the current concern there would be on the results that are being sent. So basically you just want to be in control in, form, uh, in terms of a privacy perspective, in terms of what data gets sent outward. Because um, if you're operating on data, like let's say you're within your shop, you're operating data, maybe it's something that's you know confidential to your organization. You may not want that being sent out somewhere else, um, even if it is going to be helping you with you know cleaning things up and things like that. So encryption might be a way to do that, and homomorphic would probably be the only way to prevent the other server from being able to see the data. But we'll have to kind of stay tuned and see, you know, what happens in that space. So. This Roger is kind of a cool conversation, so you have to connect with me after. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank everyone for joining us at the session. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions about the ML track and data science track in particular, feel free to come talk to me. And, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Cool. <laughs>